Welcome today to Proverbs Through the Eyes of the Living Letters. Today, we're going to be wrapping up Proverbs chapter 15. So we're going to go through a few more verses than we normally do. Uh, we normally only go through about five verses in here. Uh, today, it's going to be about eight, because uh, we're going to be we're going from verses 26 to 33 which is the final part of chapter 15. So next week, for those of you that have been walking along with us, we're going to be going into volume two of the Michelet. Uh, if you're, we've got, we've been using this book for the last, uh, you know, of course, 15 chapters. And, but this, this book has uh, two volumes that are found in it. And uh, so we're finishing up chapter 15, which will finish up the first volume. And then we'll be moving into volume two, beginning with chapter 16, next week. Now, I don't know about you guys, but this has been just absolutely awesome what Father has done in these classes. I mean, if we stop and really think about some of the things that we've talked about over the last 15 chapters has been powerful. You know, some some of the classes have been where we've dug into something. Other classes, it's just been a a, a, a spiritual enlightenment. There's been a there's been a light that has opened up some ways that we've never seen before, and that Father, you took us into this deep place, not only here in the class but also in the engagement time afterwards. So, for those of you that are joining us via YouTube, if you would like to join us for the live class, we welcome you. There's a link in the in the uh, description below, and uh, we would like to have you here because those engagement times after this particular class are not recorded. And it's meant to be that place where we have an open place of being able to share with one another and not have to worry about, you know, the world hearing what's going on. And it's great because it it gives that opportunity to really just be real and raw and, and be able to share things that we would not necessarily want to share uh, around. So we want to invite you, invite you for that because this is a safe place. This is a place that God has made to where it's it's a safe place. And there's no judgment here in this place of where we're able to share with what Father is revealing to us and what he's saying to us. And trust me, we get pretty deep in uh, in those classes. So if you're crying out to know the Lord even more, if you're crying out for, if you will, those ancient paths that that have been hidden in Scripture that, that the Father is taking us down, we invite you to be here as a part of the classes. So let's go ahead and get started in verse 26. Now, we like to use both the Michelet and the Passion Translation for those of you that are just now joining us. And uh, that way we can see it from two different versions with regards to the, the, the scripture here. I love Dr. Simmons and I love the way that he has, has translated this, but I like looking at both because it allows us to, to see a depth that we may not see looking at it from the English. And of course, we'll also dig a little bit into the Hebrew as well. This class isn't intended to, to teach Hebrew. I've got the, we've got the School of the Living Letters, which does that, uh, which teaches the letters themselves and, and the a deeper part of the scripture. But we also, you know, this class is intended to be an introduction, be a place where we begin to, to talk and discuss. And trust me, we will be talking about some of the letters throughout today. So verse 26 says this in the Mishle. Thoughts of evil are an abomination of Hashem, but words of pleasantness are pure. Now, when I look, when we look at the Passion Translation, this is the way that Dr. Simmons translates this. The Lord detests the wicked ways, or if you use this little bubble here, it says the wicked thoughts. Um uh, the, to test the wicked ways of thinking or the wicked thoughts of men, but enjoys lovely and delightful words. Now, I really believe that this particular verse kind of opens up the, the whole aspect of what we're going to be talking about today anyway, because it really begins to speak about the place of the heart and the intention of the heart. I remember quite some time ago, uh, years ago, the Lord began to revealed to me about uh, one particular statement that has rattled me since then, because I'm still seeing the revelation that, that that Father began to reveal out of that place. And that is this. I was talking to a friend of mine when it came up out of my spirit, man, um, that the intent of the heart 
forms the matrix that the words of the mouth had the ability to develop and grow in. Now, that sounds a little deep, and it, and it is very, very deep. But if we stop and think about it, I, let me explain some of those words and what they mean. The intent of the heart, I think, is pretty clear. We're talking about the place where our heart has chosen something. What is the intention behind what we're doing? Now, many times we can make choices, and sometimes that intention can be in that place of fulfilling the desires of our own flesh or following after those things that we know that the Father has called us into and made available for us. So the intention of the heart is is the first question, and really the place to me where the spirit of the fear of the Lord begins to show himself. Because when I really stop to think and use and, and, and not just immediately act, then the spirit of the fear of the Lord comes on and I realize, okay, let me weigh this out a little bit. Let me see what I'm talking about when I look at the intent of my heart. The forming the matrix. Now, that was just the way that the Lord gave it to me. But matrix can be can be seen as another word that describes a, a foundation or more than actually a foundation. It's kind of like a structure. So if I was to build like a, a how do I want to say this? So uh, one of the ways that I usually describe it, and I'll just stick with that, is, is having to do with space. Space-time is flat, according to Einstein, but at least that's the way he describes the way gravity works and so on. However, when we look at all of creation, that it's multiplicities of these straight lines, both horizontal and vertical. It's kind of like building those Lego blocks or those, uh, those uh, Lincoln logs that we used to build back when I was a kid. I know some of you, I'm really telling my age when I talk about Lincoln Logs because they haven't been around in a long time. But you know, you've got the vertical and you got the horizontal that form a scaffolding. Maybe that's a better word. Scaffolding may be a better picture of, of that because you got the horizontal and the vertical bars that hold the scaffolding up. And and as and in that matrix, there's a place where things can be done. Things can be hung, if you will. And so you've got this place where where uh, uh, even like with scaffolding, it raises you up, but it also allows you to do things on different levels, or if you want to go there with me, different dimensions. So the matrix is kind of like a, a place where something can grow in. Give you another example. The earth would be like a matrix because when you plant a seed, the forming of the earth itself becomes the womb of a woman is a matrix. So when we talk about womb, one of the other terms that can be used for matrix is a womb. So it's a place where the baby has the ability to develop and grow in. Now, do you kind of see the picture of what I'm talking about here? The intent of the heart forms that matrix that when we speak, that the words of the mouth, that when we speak, those seeds have the ability to be able to develop and grow within that matrix. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because to me, it's it really sets in play that place of the spirit of the fear of the Lord, especially as we look at it from what the Michelet says, where God abhors a person who speaks um, sweet, pure words with his lips, but abhors evil. That's what the Michelet says. Excuse me, that's not what the Michelet says. Thoughts of evil are an abomination of Hashem, but the words of pleasantness are pure. Those were my words. <laughs> the ones. So, oh, and actually, it's actually in the Michelet itself. Lord have mercy. Uh, <laughs> where the Michelet says that God abhors a person who speaks sweet, pure words with his lips, but abhors evil thoughts in his heart. So it begins to give us the idea of what the Lord's talking about. Oh, Lord, it's going to be a great day today. I know it is. <laughs> uh, Father, I thank you and I bless you, Holy Spirit. I thank you that you are the great teacher, and it doesn't matter how well I do or how, how well I don't do, that you are the great teacher here. You can uh, It's you who brings about that understanding, and I thank you that you've given us that ability to each and every one of us so that we can all hear what it is that you're saying to us, Holy Spirit, not what I'm saying. I'm a vessel, but Holy Spirit, it is you who's speaking through me. So, if you get the idea behind what I'm I'm talking about here, this 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 statement, God abhors a person who speaks sweet, uh, pure words with his lips, but a, but harbors the evil thoughts in his heart. So, in other words, it's kind of like 
talking, you know, oh, you're you're so beautiful. Oh God, why is she wearing that today? <laughs> you're so beautiful, you know, you you know, blah, 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 blah. That whole, that whole place of of trying to bump someone up, but yet in the same breath, holding in their heart the place of of disdain or anger or or whatever the case may be. So they're they're harboring something wrong inside of their heart. And I hate to say it, I know I've I've been there before, but this kind of sets the tone of where we're going into with the rest of today's uh, conversation. But let's keep one thing in mind as we continue on through this, this place of how the spirit of the fear of the Lord teaches us. How in that place of sensing and knowing the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I know some of you may, may say, well, I don't know that I really know the spirit of the fear of the Lord. You do. You do more than you think you do. You may have termed it something a little bit different, but the fact of the matter remains is that you do. There's a twinge inside of you. There's a place inside of you that makes you think, hmm, and makes you stop and think about something. Now, either your flesh will will um, overcome that and 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 diminish it and say, oh, you're th- that's just you. That's just your own head. Don't worry about that. Just do whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, I remember hearing not too terribly long ago that, and and I and I agree with this to a great extent, that the first thought that comes to us, especially when we're beginning to think about something, the first thought that comes to us is the Father. The second thought is where our own flesh tries to overcome that first voice, that first word. And so you know, I'm still trying that one out myself, you know, in hearing that and and being even more careful. Because when I heard it, it, it was teaching me. I was like, wait a minute. Okay, let me look at this a little bit different. Why? Because by reason of use, we begin to become more and more sensitive to that spirit of the fear of the Lord. That makes sense? By acknowledging it the first time, when we recognize it and then make the choice based on what we're sensing and feeling in that place, and we we recognize that it was the right decision later, the more that we do that, then the more sensitive we become. By reason of use, it's funny. I've been speaking a lot about that over the last uh, over the last week. We've had some friends come over and spent some time with them, and I remember I remember using that term several times during our conversation. Verse 27, let's continue on. One who gains through robbery sullies his home, but one who hates gifts will live. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, but this one kind of messed with me a little bit. And I'm going to explain to you what I, what I see out of this. And there's, there's a couple of different ways that we can actually see this particular verse. In the uh, Passion Translation, Dr. Simmons writes this, and I love the way he does this because it... I'm going to show you how what he is saying still fits even with what the uh, the Mishle is, is saying, even though it seems like it's speaking about two different things. The Passion Translation says, the one who puts earning money above his family will have trouble at home, but those who refuse to exploit others will live in peace. So again, it kind of looks like we've got two different aspects of here of of what's going on here because you see the one aspect in the Michelet about robbery and then in the passion translation with Dr. Simmons he says this about who puts earning of money above his family but let's stop and think about this for just a moment number 1 we've we've set the tone about looking about the spirit of the fear of the lord in the first verse here in verse 26 and so we have to carry that on into verse 27, because all of these verses are always connected. And if we stop to think about it, the one thing that is the most priceless to us should be that that of our family. When we choose to steal from our family in order to focus only on that place of earning money, then we are stealing from our family. There should be a beautiful balance between the two of them. And I know that many a man gets caught, especially men here in this one. I, I'm not diminishing you ladies here in this, but I know a lot of times 
Um, us men are single-minded. You ladies are more open-minded and can see beyond where we can't see beyond. And so um, I'm speaking of that aspect of men where we become so single-minded sometimes that we we forget about other things. And we think that in order to take care of our family, that the best thing to do is to be able to earn more money, but at the same time, steal from them to focus only on that place of making money and and not have that one-on-one intimate time that we need to have with our family as well. And so there's this is one of these things where you really need to hear the spirit of spirit of the fear of the Lord, I hear the spirit of the Lord with regards to this, because we're going to be talking about a couple of different perspectives with this particular verse. But those who refuse to exploit others will live in peace. In other words, if I refuse to exploit my family in that place of the pursuit of either power or money, then I'm then there's a place of, of living in peace. This is what the Mishle is is saying here. But doesn't it go back to the intent of the heart? What is the intent of the heart? What is the intent of the heart? Especially men I'm, 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 ladies, I know you guys are are in many cases can be breadwinners yourself, especially in in single uh, single parent homes and that sort of thing. So again, I'm not diminishing anything like this by what I'm saying. I'm just I'm bringing about this this place of of how even all of us, not men and women, that we can get so sidetracked with things that we diminish that place of our families. And if you will, like I said, we're we're stealing from them. Now it's funny because the the Hebrew word here for the word gifts. So in the that's what kind of messed with me because one who gains through robbery sullies his home. That kind of makes sense. So if I'm going to be stealing, it's going to cause issues with my home. Or if I'm going to put my money make it money making above that of my family, there's I'm going to have some difficulty at home. But the last part of this is what got me. One who hates gifts will live. And that kind of that kind of messed with me because of course when we look at the term gifts, we look at that from the perspective of of giving and that sort of thing. Well, it's a part of what we need to look at, but we really kind of need to look at the Hebrew word here to kind of, to make it make a little bit more sense. And the Hebrew word here for gifts is the Hebrew word batana. And it's mem, tet, nun, and he, excuse me, men, mem, tav, sorry, not tet, mem, tav, nun, and he. And uh, of course, mem speaks about the place of of really, in this case, what I saw the Lord speaking to me about this, Mem spoke about the place of where the Lord showed me the treasury rooms of heaven. And so the treasury rooms of heaven is like a sea. It's an ocean. I can't see or fathom or understand all the treasure that's hidden inside of the treasury rooms of heaven. So this word begins with that place of Father has already given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And I see it through that living letter, Mem. But Tav begins to speak something a little bit different here because Tav usually means the completion of something or the fulfillment of something, or if you will, the marking of something. And so when I, when I look at Tav here, this is where I see that place of the intention of the heart. What is the end game? What is the end that I see with regards to the intent of my heart, especially as it applies towards a gift, or if you will, earning money, as as Doctor Simmons writes in the Passion Translation. So that's that's one I'm going to leave kind of uh, uh, on a cliffhanger a little bit, if you will, because I want Holy Spirit to fill in the blank here. All right, you guys have heard me say this a thousand times. If you heard me say it once, if I don't leave you with more questions than I do answers, I've not done my job. And so sometimes I will I will on purpose not go any deeper because they're personal things to me. And the Holy Spirit wants to take you on that path of showing you what he's talking about there. So again, the Tav speaks about that place of the finishing or the completion of something, or really that place of the intention of the heart. What did I see as the outcome of what it was that I was talking about? Like in this place, the gift. The next letter is Nun. 
and Matanah. Nun is the letter that speaks about sons, kings, heirs, and priests. And so it's a letter that, that to me also speaks about humility, because one of the ways that you can see the living letter Nun is as the humbled prince. And so not only does it represent Yeshua first, but as he being the firstborn among many brethren, it also represents that place of us as well. And so it's it's not a lowly thing when you look at the living letter Nun. If you look at it from that perspective, you're missing the understanding of it. You're missing the depth of what the living, living letter Nun talks about. Because remember in scripture, the greatest among you is the servant of all. The one who humbles himself will be exalted, right? And so Nun begins to speak of, of that place of recognizing that place of where God has given us a power, but we, by the spirit of the fear of the Lord, recognize that power and we're humbled by it and only and and are and know and learn how to use that power that he's given us. And how does that happen? Well, the last letter in Matanah is the living letter Hey. So just by the fact that we've got hey at the end of this, it makes this word feminine, which means that it produces something. Right? So in that place of humility, as I begin to speak, I will begin to frame. You see, that statement I made in verse 26 really fits well when we look at it from the perspective of the living letter hey. The intent of the heart forms the matrix because the living letter hey, the framework is that same place of the matrix that we're talking about. And I love that just to kind of take that that whole that whole process a little bit further. Hey, to me, is a pregnancy letter because it's a Dalit that contains a Yod. So it's a mother who contains the child. All right. Or huh, I remember 30 years ago in church, us talking about there was there was this big thing where men were running around saying, I'm pregnant with the word of God. I'm pregnant with the word of God. And it was a proud thing to go around and say that we were pregnant with the word of God, even though uh, even though as men. So. Uh, the the fact is is that 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 even in men this is a this is an expression why because it's the birthing of that which the father has placed on the inside of us and that that we have taken the time to protect cover feed and allow it to come to the place of maturity where it can then become tangible in the earth that makes sense where it can be born and now it becomes a a new, a new, well, it's a new soul. It's a new spirit inside of the, the mother's womb. Yes. But when that, that child is born, there's a tangibility to it. So that, and that child begins to grow on their own and begin to learn on their own up until that point, while it's in the mother, the mother is everything that that child needs. Think about it. El Shaddai, the many breasted one is, is the, in the Hebrew where it, where it can, it gives that picture of that in El Shaddai. I am all that you need. You see, the mother is a perfect picture of El Shaddai in, uh, in looking at the living letter Hey, But when we look at the Strong's here for this, it's H4976, for those of you that like to, to study deep, it talks about how matana can be a present, uh, specifically in a good, like in a good sense, a sacrificial offering. But in a bad sense, it can be seen as a bribe. All right. So another way that this could be written is that the one who hates bribes will live. So it begins to open up a question because both of those can be true. In the Michelet itself, there's a section at the bottom where it's got some footnotes and, and it begins to talk about a particular uh, rabbi and how that uh, that what they would do in some cases would literally refuse gifts. And because they were looking at this verse in the sense of where they were saying this, this, this gift, and I'm talking about just a gift that even if it was deserved, that they would, uh, they would refuse that gift. 
And I'm going to give you a I'll give you a hint and how this kind of starts to make sense. See, this is the beauty of where the the Hebrew begins to open up so much more, because when we go to the scripture and we begin to see what the story talks about, it helps us to understand a little bit more about what's going on. See, this the one the one story I want to tell you guys is actually in Numbers uh, chapter 16 verses 11 through 15, and it it's cutting into the place of where. Uh, Moses is talking with Korah or Korah, uh, and we're talking about Korah's rebellion. If you remember, one of the one of the men from the tribe of Levi rose up and said that he felt like he should have been the high priest, and that Aaron was not the one to become high priest. And he be, Korah begins to take a group of men and and bring a group of of people together who have have gone against what Moses. What God had instituted with Moses and Aaron and had said, we're the ones that need to be uh, the, the high priest and uh, that God had got it, gotten it wrong, if you will. And if you remember the story, uh, then Moses goes before God and he, and, and he speaks with God and basically comes out and says, well, let God be the one that judges between us. And that's when he had the men come out and meet him at the uh at in in the camp itself or outside the camp and there was a there was a conversation that went on in this place so verse 11 kind of cuts into this story and in verse 11 it says this therefore it is against the lord that you and all your company have gathered together what is aaron that you grumble against him and moses sent to call dathan and abiram the sons of eliab and they said we will not come up. It is, is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land of flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you must also make yourself a prince over us? Now they're trying to equate the land flowing with milk and honey is Egypt. This is not the promised land that he's talking about. Is it a small thing that you, Moses, have brought us up out of that land of where we had everything that we needed, even though we were in bondage? And to allow us to die in the in the wilderness, and that you also make yourself a prince over us. Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey. Now they're talking about the promised land. Nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put the eyes of will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey gift. I have not taken one donkey from them, and I have not harmed one of them. And so now we begin to see this place of where Moses is saying, I didn't take anything from these people. Now, did that equate out to the places of the tabernacle and the, 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 the bringing of the offerings into the tabernacle? No, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about something a little different in the sense where even though Moses in his process of doing something could have used something that they had, Moses refused to take anything from anybody and only take those things that he himself owned. Like with his family, when they were coming back, he used his own donkey to be able to transfer, even though he could have gone to one of the tribes and asked them for donkeys to be able to bring his family home. He didn't. In this case. So we begin to start to see a little bit of what this is talking about when it's talking about gifts. And I asked the Lord, I said, how do I, how would I, how would I say this? I believe that the idea of the gift here is in the sense of receiving the gift that could infer some sort of repayment, coercion, or manipulation. In other words, a gift for a gift. And that's by the intention of the giver. So what do I mean by that? That sometimes when, have you ever done this before? I know I, there have been a time when I have done this before. And I would give something thinking that because I gave, I would get something back. And so it was almost like this coercion that said, you know, that to, to give someone to someone, because I, I felt like this person would be, someone who could give something back to me, right? Um, just to be very open and honest with you, I remember years ago, the Lord taking me through a place 
that rattled my faith to the point of almost believing that that none of this was real or true because it rattled the place of my faith. And a lot of it had to do with my own matrix, the matrix of what I, of the intention of my own heart. You see, I heard what the, the, the faith preachers were speaking about, and it's beautiful. Don't get me wrong. We have to have that base understanding of what faith is talking about. Do not diminish those things where the Lord has, has spoken to us. Even though we may be seeing things a little bit differently now, don't diminish those things because every one of them were a part of us growing up and learning. Are you following me? So don't, don't say, oh, that was, that was wrong. No, no, it wasn't. The Lord taught us the right way of thinking through that. And let me share with you my experience with that. So a lot of it, some of you may remember those days of the old name it, claim it, right? That I began to name something and claim something. So I began to pray and I would begin to, to give more than my tithes and offerings. My wife and I both did. We would give above and beyond. In some cases, we were well, just, just, just saying, I'll give it, we were giving above and beyond. The numbers are irrelevant. All right. And but the idea of what I had in my heart was this place of, well, the scripture does say, give and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shaking together, running over, will men give into your bosom? And that's absolutely true. But what was the intention of my heart? You see, I understood the beginning parts of that faith, and I recognized that it was a powerful tool to be able to begin that aspect but my thinking still wasn't right. My thinking was more along the lines of, I do I really deserve this? God, do I really, you know, uh, in other words, I had po a poverty mindset. And so the framework that I was building was that of poverty, even though the words that I was speaking were something completely different. Let's go back to verse 26. And what it talked about in verse 26, Selah, right there. So I remember that that as I did that, the Lord actually walked us into a place where we began to prosper greatly. The problem was that because the matrix I had built was that of poverty, when the blessings began to come, it crushed the matrix. It fell because it wasn't built in that place where my, my own maturity was able to handle that place of the blessing that he was pouring out and it about crushed us matter of fact that's that that was the beginning of the place where it's like well this obviously doesn't work for us it works for everybody else and it doesn't work for us and so you see where this this in this i began to to question everything and father began to show me that there was a maturing and a growing. Let's go back to Matana, the nun. Even though it's speaking of the humbled prince, even though it's speaking of the place of, of, of humility or being bent over, because the living letter nun is bent over at the top, uh, it also speaks about the nun sofit or the nun final. Nun finals are letters that are found at the end of a Hebrew word. And they take the meaning of the letter and expands it out to its greatest extent. So if nun means humility, and nun is that place of being a prince, and that place of, of maturity, even in the humility, nun final speaks of multiplication, as well as it speaks about the place, because there's only been one definition that the Lord's ever given me about nun final, or nun sofit. And that is nun final sofit, I'm, I'm using... Uh, Sophie is the Hebrew term for final there. And so I'm I'm using those interchangeably so that you, if you go to search for them, if you look for Sophie, you might find it uh, easier than you would if you were trying to search for nun final. All right. Uh, Sophie is spelled S-O-P-H-I-T. So uh, from that place, there's only one definition the Lord's ever given me of that. And that is this, till we all come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. So you see the picture of what I'm talking about here? And so Korah, Korah, you know, if you if we go on with the rest of the story, we see this place where Moses was saying, listen, 
I have not taken anything from them. That that the only things that have come in is the things for the tabernacle itself. And I personally have not taken anything from them. And of course, the story goes on to say that that in this challenge, the Moses began to speak to Korah, and he said that that if I am the if I'm right here, because God was the one who established this, then let the earth itself open itself up and swallow you. And right after he finished the statement there, the earth itself opened up, swallowed up Korah and his company that were with him, and then closed back over top of them. S- uh, solidifying the fact that this was Father's word here, spoken, and not that of Moses. So, when we look at this, we can look at it not only from the perspective of a bribe. You see, if I look at the story of Korah, and the reason why by Moses said, I didn't even receive a donkey from them, it was kind of in that place of gift for gift. And, and a lot of times when we see this gift for gift, it's, it's a place of coercion or manipulation. Just like me, when I was telling my story about what we had done years ago, I was trying to manipulate God into giving back to us because the scripture said that's what he would do but yet at the same time didn't have the maturity to be able to handle that at that time and it almost destroyed us i hope you're seeing the picture of what i'm saying here and if anything the spirit of the this is where the spirit of the fear of the lord comes in and begins to teach us that place of Father, then teach me that place of being able to know, to being able to form a matrix. Let me understand first who I am, that beloved identity. I love Damon Thompson and what he he teaches a lot of, and that's beloved identity. The fact that I am beloved and that 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 I am with God. But I can be beloved from the eyes of the Father, but yet struggle in myself seeing myself as beloved. Are you following me? We struggle in our own selves, but wait a minute, what God, what about all the things that I've done? What about this? What about that? And we diminish that place of who we are and we're lacking in, in that identity because once we really know who we are, and we're getting, we are there. We are not only there, we are getting there. And we're we're constantly moving into this place of where Father is revealing more and more and more to us. And the more he does, then the more we begin to realize the power that he's given us. And along with that power comes the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Yes, without a doubt. But with that, with that also comes trust. Because I chose to do what I what I sensed the Lord, and I began to grow, and I began to look at myself and correct the place of myself, right? I corrected in here, corrected my thinking, and then the Father began to add that much more to it. That brought trust, and the more that I did that, it brought about a place of confidence. I was confident in what I knew that the Lord had spoken to me. So... Sometimes when we talk about this verse, not only are we talking about the place of bribes in this place of, if you will, tit for tat, if you will, or gift for gift, but also in the place of gifts throughout, just like what what Moses was talking about. Uh, Throughout the generations, God-fearing people scrupulously avoided any financial dealings that might make them recipients rather than givers. You see, this goes to a very deep thing that uh, that we talk about in a lot, a lot in our classes, and I want to share with you guys today, and that is this. God always gives, always. He is always good. There is nothing evil in Father at all. There's there James chapter 1, I believe. Um, in him, there is no variableness, no shadow of turning is what it says there. So there is no evil in him. He's always good. And he, he's always bringing about good. even the difficulties and the times that we walk through something. It's that place of him revealing that place of the goodness. It's teaching us. It's maturing us. It's allowing us to grow. Are you following me? And, and so from that place, 
if in the place where he is always good, then then he and he always gives, number one, then there's the place of why do I receive? You see, if God's always a giver, then I'm a receiver. And he made us to be receivers. You know, in other words, he made us into, if you will, a womb or an empty space. You remember the old saying that we used to talk about years ago, if there's a if there's a God-shaped hole inside of us that only he can fill? Of course, the same is also true if I ask the question in reverse. Is there a man-shaped hole inside of you, God, that only we can fill? That, Father, you made yourself vulnerable for us because you wanted us to be one? Let me give you the proof for it, just so you don't think I'm crazy. John chapter 17. Father, that they may be one, just as you and I are one. Us in them and them in us. There's your proof right there for what I'm saying. And so in this place of what I'm what I'm talking about here, Thank you, Father. Sometimes I'll I'll begin to go along a thing and try to explain something long enough <laughs> that I lose track. <laughs> the train just derailed right in the middle of that. Uh, uh, and I don't I don't mind telling you that. I don't mind at all because we all go through it. Uh, that place of work. God always gives. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Then the question is, as being receivers, what is the intention of our hearts when we receive? Is our heart's an intention is to receive for just myself? In other words, whatever God gives, I use for my own use and my own desires. Or am I one who, just as Yeshua said when he was here on the earth, that he only does what he sees the Father does, that am I one who wants to receive in order to be able to give? You see, that's what Yeshua did. He gave because the father had given to, to him. Now, there's a deep place that I'd like to go right there, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to right now. There's a beautiful expression in, in all of that that we're talking about. But do you see the picture of what I'm talking about? What is the intention of our heart of us receiving for the father? My heart is, Father, I want to receive to be able to, be, to give because I want to be like you. I want to do what I see you do, just like Yeshua said when he said, I only do what I see the Father do. And that you made that available to even us to be able to do what we see you do. Thank you, Father. So let's continue on. We've got a lot of verses to go through. I knew that one was going to take a little while because it was one that, that really, it challenged me and it had me digging into it very deeply to see what it was that, that it was saying and how it could be seen from multiple perspectives. And the beautiful thing about it is I never came to a conclusion as to which one it was, nor will I. Because in he Hebraic thought, it's never this or that. It's always this and that. In other words, you listen to what Holy Spirit is telling you in the situation that you are in, and he will show you how each part of that applies in that. Verse 28, in the Mishle, it says this. The heart of a righteous person Yeah, the heart of a righteous person will consider what to answer, but the mouth of the wicked will utter evil. I kind of mentioned this a little bit ago when and of course the title of today's uh, class was that of lovers of God think before they speak. And it was directly out of the Passion Translation, because in verse 28, that's exactly what Do Dr. Simmons writes. Lovers of God think before they speak, but the careless blurt out wicked words meant to cause harm. Now we're talking about that intentionality of the things that we say, right? Remember that the scripture tells us that out of the abundance of the heart, we've been dealing with that for the last two verses. The last, yeah, last two verses. And now we're going to that place of the things that we speak, because out of the abundance of that heart, the mouth begins to, to speak. And I love the way that Dr. Simmons writes this with the fact, the, the place of the lovers of God. 
think before they speak. When we when we love the Father, one of the first things that we begin to recognize has to do with this statement. I've often asked this question in here and in other classes, and I've said this, if God is in me and God is in you, should I not approach you with the same honor and protocol that I would with Father? Because there is a reflection and there is a a, a facet of God inside of you that he made you to be. And each and every one of us are priceless in that place. So if you will, if you want to see the face of God, look into the face of humanity. Never said that before. But say la on that one. So can I really say that I've never seen the face of God? I've never seen the pure essence of who Father is himself, because we are expressions of those things that can be shared from him. But yet at the same breath, each one of us are made into that beautiful facet that he made us to be. And we shine his light through us. We have a treasure on the inside of us that he placed that only we can give. I remember when Jen uh, put up that uh, that little meme that basically said that when we see ourselves as a, a family, as a community, as a, as a whole, as a chad, that we begin to realize that unless we put in our two bits, the whole system would fail. Think about that. What you have is important. And so in this place, when I'm beginning to think about, now, no, I, I want to, I do want to go back. I heard Holy Spirit say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You got a little bit more to say there. I'm talking about to not only sons, those, those that we know who know and love the Lord, I'm talking about everybody, everybody on the face of the earth. Each one of us in that has ever been and that currently lives right now and that will currently live is a is a light and a facet of the diamond of Yahweh, the facet of himself, period. Whether they were what we called saved or unsaved, it doesn't matter. Almost wipe those things because they have a perspective of father that we don't have. And so in that place, when we think about approaching and beginning to speak from that place, if God is in me and God is in you, should I not approach you in the same honor and protocol that I would father? Now you see where that makes sense. So there's a, a place of where I need to be careful of what I speak and think before I speak. Why? Because I'm talking about that place of then engaging with this person and not wanting to cause any place of where I'm diminishing them or causing them to think little of themselves or anything like that, where, you know, we remember the old sayings that we used to say years ago, sticks and stones may break my bones, but her words will never hurt me. Well, that was that place of trying to, to come against that place of where words would, would uh, uh, words don't have the ability to really hurt us. And that's right. They don't unless we give them power. But sometimes when the words are very specific or very, in, in, especially with somebody who really knows us, it can really hurt. <laughs> I mean, I, I almost hate I almost hate that term uh, with that. The sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me because words do hurt. But in the same breath, as I began to learn more and more, and I'm still growing in that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I've not arrived. None of us have arrived yet in that place. But as we begin to grow, we begin to recognize more of who we are. So those things are are able to go, no, no, I know who I am in Christ. So those words don't, don't harm me. But even still, sometimes they, they can still hurt in that place. But you see, one who doesn't care, one who, if you will, see someone as lower than or diminished. I, I love this word, uh, contempt. And I remember years ago, Lord taking me through this, this process of really understanding the whole idea behind contempt or contemptuous, you know, because the, the words came up out of the, 
uh, something that I had heard, and I don't think it's scripture. I don't think it's scripture. I think it's just a uh, it's just a saying that has a lot of power and meaning, and probably based in scripture somewhere. But that is that um, familiarity breeds contempt. When you know someone well, that there is a place where you begin, you can have the opportunity to be able to judge them based on your own issues. And many times we can put ourselves in either a lower than or a higher than state. I can see someone as higher if they're successful and and uh, making a lot of money and da, 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 da. And I can see them as a higher in a place of being higher than me. Or if I see someone who's struggling and having difficulties or or they're doing things that I don't do or that I have no, I have no, have not been tempted on or anything like that, then I can see them as below me. And, and, and as a result of that, I'm treating someone less than who they really are in the diamond of Yahweh. And for those of you that not, don't know what I'm talking about here, I have a video in the in YouTube that speaks about the diamond of Yahweh. Go back and listen to that, and this will make sense from that. But in this place of the diamond of Yahweh, every one of us are equal. There is no one above, and there is no one that's below. And so there is an honor, an equal honor amongst, amongst all of us. Ask anybody that's been in our classes for any length of time, not only here, but in the School of the Living Letters and Yeshiva, that, that, that that's exactly what we talk about. We come together in these classes as a table of priests, as a table of kings, and that there's not one above nor one below in this place. So in this place of careless words, it's because I've moved in this place of contempt. Make sense? I, I have judged and saw somebody either above or below me, and I would blurt out these wicked words meant to cause harm, meant to to be to 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 hurt the person and 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 and, and if you will, meant to really manipulate them into following the ways that I do things. you know, I could go a thousand different places with that right there. It's uh, um, it's, it's, it's funny when we start to think about things like this, how it opens up so much more, uh, with regards to this, but I am either hurting them because I see them contemptuously, or I see them as above me and I'm trying to bring them down to my level or below me. Does that make sense? And the whole part of that is the intention of my heart. You know, let's go back to me talking about the fact of, of when I told you that, that, that I would pray and believe that God would give us blessings, and he did, but my matrix, my foundation, my framework was not able to handle that blessing. And so uh, it began to, to crash down on top. Well, many times that that because of that hurt, because of that pain, you know, that that there's this, this place of where I would look at others, especially if they were wealthier than me, and say, well, they, this, the, the, you know, uh, I, I don't want to use any particular terms here. I'm, I'm kind of being vague on purpose, but I think just by the way that I'm doing this, you, you'll understand, well, they got all this and da, 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 and why don't they do something? And why don't they, bop, bop? why, why God is the one who gives now. I know he can give through men, but God is the one who gives and and my heart and the way that I see it has a lot to do with that. Again, you can see that that today, one of the major things that we've talked about is the intention of the heart. So in the Mishle, it says this, the heart of a righteous one will consider what to answer. But the mouth of the wicked will utter evil. That's one of those verse. A righteous person will think before he speaks, and their words are few. The wicked will say whatever they think without, without ever considering the consequences. But a righteous person uses his heart to consider that friend's feelings and avoid shocking him. But a wicked person has no heart to feel his friend's pain. Now, that really kind of begins to open up it. The story in the Mishle, it begins to go into this place of, of how where two rabbis come together and they're trying to tell one another that their family members have passed away. 
But in the midst of their conversation, they never said their family members had passed away. But by the way that they spoke it, both of them knew instinct- instinctively what it was talking about. You know, it made me think about it, just, just as a way of putting it in a modern term, it made me think about it. Have you ever been watched a movie? All right. Or even been in the situation yourself where you walk into a situation and you're having to break some very bad news to someone and from your face alone and from the frequency of your heart, the person instinctively knows what happened. And they began to cry because they knew, and you really never even had to open up your mouth. It was just that place of, of your heart and your your heart of the pain for your friend that you had, and you wanted to, to protect them. You really don't want to have to use those words, but again, because of their, because of that frequency, because of that place of, of even the way that you showed your face, it, it affected them. And they knew what you were talking about without ever saying, see, have, huh, makes me think how often, and I'm saying this rhetorically, and I'm thinking of myself when I say it, how often do we say things sometimes and our real intent is that place of, of causing hurt or harm and that we don't really take the time to really think about what it is that we're saying or how we're saying it. You see, the way that we say something is equally as important, if not more important than what we say. Agreed? The way that something is said is, I really believe, far more important than the than the actual words themselves. Because the way that we say it expresses the intent of our heart. Now, I don't know about you, but that's where the Spirit of the Fear of the Lord grabs a hold of me and says, then let me do this out of the place of recognizing that you are a facet of the diamond of Yahweh, just like I am. All right. Let's continue on. In verse 29, it says this, Hashem is far from the wicked, but he will hear the prayer of the righteous. You begin to see where we're, we're, we're following a flow here, even from that uh, previous verse. Right? Because in the, in the Passion Translation, Dr. Simmons says this, the Lord doesn't respond to the wicked, but he's moved to answer the prayers of the righteous. It's getting a little... My system is responding a little slow. I apologize, y'all. So if the, it's jumping around, I apologize. The Lord doesn't respond to the wicked, but he's moved to answers to answer the prayers of the righteous. You know... And it's funny because this will actually lead into the next verse as well. But um, as a matter of fact, that's what I was thinking of as as I was uh, looking at this and reminded of the next verse. So I'm going to hold on to what I was about ready to say until I get to the next verse. But a major Torah theme is actually taught here. This is out of the, uh, the Mishle itself. The juxtaposition of good and evil is an impossibility. So in other words, it's talking about, just like I mentioned just a few moments ago, God is the source of pure goodness, period. There is no evil can emanate from him at all. Evil begins, listen to this, evil begins when man attempts to limit God's sphere of influence. Let me repeat that again. Evil begins when man attempts to limit God's sphere of influence. When human beings try to push him out of their lives, they invite misfortune. For the absence of God is synonymous with misery. And so, again, let's let's continue on with this 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 flow here, because I, in the Mishlei, it really goes into some really good points here. According to to Mary, uh, verses twenty seven through twenty nine all address this one theme: how careful a judge must be in order to assure that justice is achieved. One who hates gifts, verse 27, refers to a judge who hates bribes. Verse 28 urges the judge to be very patient and deliberate. So first off, he's not going to receive bribes to give another judgment. 
He at uh, verse 28 urges the judge to be very patient and deliberate, carefully considering the issue before him in order to ca- execute tr- a true verdict. Right? So now we're looking at this place of of weighing things out. Verse 29 assures that God will accept a righteous judge uh prayer for divine guidance to avoid mistaken ver- verdicts. And 1 Kings 3 verses 9 uh, actually in the in the Mishle, it just says verse 9, but I want to read verse 9 through 13, and you'll see the picture of what this is talking about, because this is exactly what happened with Solomon. Verse 9 starts with this, give your servant therefore an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may, be, may, be, may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people? Now, this is the conversation between Solomon and God, and Solomon had just said, this in verse 10 and 11, it it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God to, had, had said to him, because you have asked this, have not asked for yourself, he asked for wisdom to govern the people of Israel. Because you have asked this and not have, have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, uh, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked yourself for an understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind. So he gave him the wisdom so that no one like you has been before and no one like you shall ever arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all of your days. And so you begin to see where this particular verse is talking about that place of learning how to judge something, learning how to, uh, man, I wish I could get into this. Maybe in the uh, in the engagement time afterwards, there's, there's something deep that I want to say here, but I don't want to say on the recording right now because there's so much that goes in with, with what I'm, what I'm about ready to say. And I apologize for those of, the, those of you that are watching the video. Um, so come on in, <laughs> join us here in the class. And that way you can hear some of these things. But sometimes I hear the Lord say, this is for the people that are here and specific. So um, uh, there's something I want to say about that. But God not only heard the prayer of Solomon, he gave him even more than what he had asked for. That place of the righteous son of Solomon. And so... If we see this, we see this place of where the Lord doesn't respond to the wicked. Now, number one, this looks at like as if the Lord is looking at us from the basis of sin. Okay? Agreed. Agreed. I'm not diminishing that. However, that is the the effect, not the cause. Because in verse 30, this will begin to make a little bit more sense. And I'm going to come back to what I mean by that in verse 29 here in just a second. In the Mishle, it says, enlightened eyes will gladden the heart. Good news will fatten a bone. Right? So it's talking about the the, the eyes that see. So verse 30 in in the Passion Translation says, eyes that focus on what is beautiful bring joy to the heart. And hearing a good report refreshes and strengthens the inner being. But what this begins to to really talk about is that place of what we see, all right? And I'm going to bring some things, some pretty deep stuff here in just a few minutes with regards to this. So how this applies to the previous verse is that... uh, All right, wait. How it applies to the uh, this this other verse has to do with this. Uh, one of the things that the Lord shared with me quite some time ago had to do with the place of veils, right? And I remember asking the Lord about, well, what veils still remain? You know, when Yeshua died on the cross, he rent the veil in two. So what veils still remain? And the what he told me was that the only veils that remain were the veils that we placed up. So in other words, we put, if you will, 
a barrier or, or erected a veil which diminished the light of God within that person. You remember back the verse before, uh, verse 27, where it says that it talks about the place of, of the, the absence of light is, is equates to misery. Remember that? So I'm going back and I'm pulling from the, the very verses that we're talking about today for the answer to what this is talking about, as well as verse 30. You're going to see the difference in just a minute. And so when in the place where we have placed these veils that we place on us that that place of get back to verse 29 we chose to put that veil up all right and so we have blocked the light of god so the effect is that god doesn't respond to the wicked why because we put a blockage between us and didn't allow and are not allowing the word of god to come to us because we place that that veil up because i remember and i hope this is making sense here because i'm i know i'm kind of jumping around a little bit right here um but i want to try to make it as clear as i possibly can here in saying this i remember when the lord began to to share me share with me this i began to see this place of in this blockage i'm blocking off the light of god and i've i'm protecting a place that I don't want either God to let into or or I'm I'm diminishing myself in seeing myself as something other than what he has made me to be. And so the the veil equates to this place of wickedness because wickedness is something that I choose to do, not something that happens by mistake, but something that I choose to do. Does that make sense? And I remember asking the Lord about this when, when I was talking about these veils. I said, well, then, Lord, remove the veils from me. Remove those veils. And he, told, he looked at me and said, no, he did. To blew me away because it was just no. And I was like, I was thrown back by it. But he didn't, and I didn't have a chance to respond before he said, I didn't put those veils up. You did. You removed those veils. It's your responsibility to remove those veils. You see, what I'm talking about is that place of overcoming. The scripture never tells us to really become to that place of being sinless. You know, although although we 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 look at that so much in that place of where sin is such a a huge part of of what it, what you know, what we think about in that place of our understanding, and that's what we've been taught, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But the fact of the matter remains is that God called us to overcome. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I don't have to worry about being perfect. What was the intent of my heart? My intent of my heart was to do those things which were run. And that's what the Father looks on. So you, you're kind of beginning to see this where where we see that uh, the reason why he doesn't respond to the wicked isn't because of the sin that we've done, but because we purposely put a block between him. And in that place of him being a gentleman, he's not going to be able to address that particular place. So it's not his fault. If you will, it's ours. Or it's our responsibility. Maybe I shouldn't say fault. Um, thank you, Holy Spirit. Fault is not the right word there. Fault implies that place of, of something else, but our responsibility to recognize that we have blocked off God. We have blocked him from being able to do so. We, the way we believe or whatever it may be. And now, Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you would reveal to those that are here and those that are listening on YouTube, that place of those veils to them. I know you're still revealing those veils in me. It's not a, it's not a one time for all and it's gone. But it's a progressive thing where you're allowing me to, to become more and more and more like you and showing me those things so that there's intentionality behind the removing of that veil and understanding about how not to go back into or putting that veil back in place. That, that kind of makes sense, y'all. Are you seeing what I'm saying here? So why does that matter? Well, enlighten eyes. When, when we remove that veil, that's what I was trying to get to here. When we remove that veil, it gladdens the heart. And it actually adds, because it says good news will fatten a bone. 
it actually strengthens the foundation or strengthens the framework of what he has placed on the inside of us. Does that make sense? That fat in a bone be, being a metaphor of strengthening that place of, of recognizing, just like the, the whole process that I was talking about just a second ago, where once I realize it's there and, and he helps me to remove that veil, then there is a cognizant way that I have walked through that situation. I have learned from that situation so that I never put that veil back up in place. And what does that do? It strengthens my foundations. It strengthens my core. It strengthens the place of confidence in my Father. Amen? All right, verse 31. Let's continue on because I need to wrap this up. I know I figured we would go a little bit later today. And I really want to look at these last three verses almost as one. Because they they begin to really speak you know what I didn't read the passion translation for verse 30 so let's go back to that eyes that focus on what is beautiful bring joy to the heart and hearing a good report refreshes and strengthens the inner being I love the way that he he says this it still it still fits within the realm of what I was talking about. Uh, because when we look at that place on on what is beautiful, that the light, the pure light of the Father, and that I've not put any blockage between us, we've removed that that veil, that it does bring joy to the heart. It may bring pain for just a moment because that light can kind of go Ooh, sting just a little bit, but it begins to bring about a healing and uh, a brings about a place of beautiful joy, just like the moment of birth. You know, when a woman is is having and giving birth, it's painful during that transition period between the the coming from the womb into the place of being birthed in the earth. It hurts. But the moment that that child is born, all that pain is forgotten for the joy of being able to hold on to that which the father's given. Perfect example, perfect metaphor. So verse 31 says this. In the uh, Mishle, the ear that hears life-giving reproof will abide in the midst of the wise. I'm going to go ahead and read all three of the verses. He who rejects discipline despises his soul, but he who listens to reproof acquires an understanding heart. The last verse, fear of Hashem is the discipline, or fear of the Lord, is the discipline of wisdom, and humility precedes honor. The reason I want to to bring these together because I begin I really believe that it it brings a place of of of, of completion to what we've been talking about today. In the in the Passion Translation, it says accepting constructive criticism opens your heart to the path of life, making you right at home among the wise. So it's talking about this place of of recognizing that that sometimes sometimes there's a place of us challenging one another, right? Where uh, I, and I like to the way I like to do it is is funny enough through encouragement. It's rare unless I really know somebody really well. Well, I kind of speak something that may be a little harder, but uh, for the most part, I can give encouragement on someone that brings about a place of saying, "Hey, look beyond." I was thinking about a conversation that I had not too terribly long ago, and uh, I was talking to a young man, and we were talking about the difference between a teacher a teacher and a counselor. And, and he was telling me that there's a big difference between the two. And I turned around and said, you know what? That's, that's awesome because the counselor looks on the, looks at the one-on-one -on -one and the teacher may be looking at the place of, of talking to many people at the same time. I said, however, is the heart behind the counselor, not the same as the teacher? Because what it's doing is taking that one that they're counseling and showing them something where they can look beyond look past the way that they see things at a particular time and uh, and to be able to see something more. Isn't the heart of the teacher the same thing? And I began to challenge him on that place of they weren't, they weren't really as different as he thought they were. And uh, a very, very smart young man <laughs> uh, when in, in this, he was a teenager. And so it was, uh, we, we were talking about pseudo psychology and, 
uh, teaching and counseling. <laughs> I mean, that was you talk about you talk about smart young man. That's that's what I'm talking about. And he was very articulate in 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 understanding the pseudo psychology behind all of this. So it begins to open up this place of of where, just like we talked about earlier, does it have to be harsh when we talk about constructive criticism? Can it not be in that place of being encouragement? that allows Holy Spirit to be the one that reveals to the person, not you. The Holy Spirit reveals to that person, and they begin to understand and to see beyond. And in doing so, when, you, when you're one that accepts that and recognize that this is that's, that's true, then what does it do? It, it shows wisdom because it starts talking about Musar. Remember, Musar is discipline, and that discipline to receive – when we may have be limiting ourselves in the way that we see something. Verse 32 in the uh, Mishle says this, he who rejects discipline despises his soul. Well, verse 32 in the Passion goes on to say, it's a flow of verse 31, refusing constructive criticisms, criticism shows you have no interest in improving your life. For revelation insight only comes as you accept correction or musar, discipline. Musar is the Hebrew word for discipline. And so you see that constructive criticism begins to take us into the place of the wise, but refusing that basically turns us towards the fool because we're not allowing those things that that could allow us to see beyond. We're, ref we're refusing them, rejecting them. And that brings us, and of course, most of the Proverbs so far, we've talked about a lot about the wise and the fool. And you're showing that you really have no interest in improving your life. And I've I've had friends that have been just like that and totally refused anything that you had to say. Even though it might have been a, a something that was wisdom to them, they totally rejected it. I'm thinking of, of somebody in, in mind right now. And and they because they they were like the way that i see it is the right way okay that's fine you're right i could be wrong and uh but although even though i was careful in in giving the constructive criticism uh they they still rejected it because it was different from the way that they saw things why because the way that we see things is paramount to the way that we understand them that makes sense the way that we see things is critical in the way that we understanding them understand them. That's the reason for the two questions that many of you have heard a thousand times. You've heard once, what do you see and how do you see it? Right? Why? Because it brought that place into allowing me to recognize and to make that conscious choice about how do I see this thing that is before me right at the moment. I found this interesting, and I can't, I don't have time to go into it right now. I found this interesting that something that Michelet brought out, especially with this uh, verse 30, especially that, and, and I'm bringing it into here in verse 31 and 32 on purpose, because if you notice, we first started talking about sight, enlightened eyes, and then we started talking about hearing, especially the place of constructive criticism, right? And the Michelet says this there are three spiritual senses sight, hearing, and smelling. And there are two physical senses, touching and tasting. Now, in the Michelet, it goes into this a little bit deeper, and, it's, and it challenges where it says that when it speaks of God, the two senses that are never mentioned are touching and tasting. Now, I found that interesting. Because especially, and I, I don't know about you, but first thing that pops up into my mind is taste and see that the Lord is good, right? Doesn't it with y'all? But he's talking about us. He's talking about that, that physical, that fleshly part of us. And he says, taste of me and see that I am good. What's the point that he's trying to make? See and taste my goodness. God is always good. So he doesn't have to taste. And when it comes to this place of touching, he is, you know, that's a little bit deeper. And I don't want to get into that right now because I didn't have a, I, I'd, I'd like to have spent a little bit more time thinking about that. And I'm going to meditate on that a little bit more. 
particularly about the touching aspect of it, because because I start thinking about the laying on of hands. And when God touches, well, that's an English word that we use to describe what it is that he's talking about. And we're actually talking about the physical sense of touching something. And so I I, I don't fully, I'm still digging in that one. Just let me, let me leave it like that. Now, some of you may have uh, something that you want to add to that. And if you do during the engagement time, please do. Refusing constructive criticism shows you have no interest in improving your life. For revelation in only insight only comes as you accept correct correction and the wisdom that it brings. Right? Verse 33. The source of revelation knowledge is found as you fall down and surrender before the Lord. Don't expect the Shekinah glory until your Lord sees your humility. So it, it comes to this place of, of bringing us back to that place of the humbleness. In the Mishle, uh, I'll read it again, what, what verse 33 says. Fear of Hashem, fear of the Lord, is the discipline of wisdom, and humility precedes honor. Now, I like the way the, the Mishle speaks it here, because then it opens into this place of, of for the fear of, of, the fear of the Lord is discipline, the Musar, that place of choosing how we see something. What do you see? How do you see it? And to take that time to be intentional about what we're talking about, because in that tensionality, it's going to bring about that place of wisdom. The fear of the Lord will show us along with that place of our choice to see it and brings about wisdom. But in that wisdom, humility precedes honor. You see, the wiser we get, According to the scripture, the wiser we get, the more humble we become. Why? Because we begin to recognize the power of what Father has given us in the place of his spirit in us and our words that we speak out of that place. That our words do have power and they do form the very creation that lies before us. I've said this before in this class. If you want to know the future, Listen to the words that you're saying, because your words will create your future. And truth be told, by that and in that, you already know your future because you know the things that you've spoken. Now, I love this because one of the expressions here, and I like the way that Dr. Simmons brought in the, the Shekinah or Shekinah, as we say in the, in, in the U.S., because the, the, the Shekinah or the Shekinah glory that we're talking about here, many times we have seen as being separate from us. I remember years ago, and I'm going to wrap it up with this. I remember years ago, we used to sing these songs, Shekinah glory come down, Shekinah glory come down. You remember those? And we talked about the the, the Lord, send us your glory, drop your glory. And I was right in the middle of a, of a particular church service. And something struck me, and it was like, wait a minute, if the temple of God is in here, if heaven is right here inside of my heart, why in the world am I singing glory, Shekinah glory come down? Should I not be saying Shekinah glory come out from me? And from that moment on, even though the church was continuing to sing the song, I kept singing Shekinah glory come out. Shekinah glory come out. And this is where I talk about the renting of those veils and the the, the veils that we've placed over our heart. Because in that place of the, the veils being torn inside of us, the light of the Father is able to, to penetrate not only in us, but through us. And his light, his glory is seen and felt within that place because it's his glory. It's no different. It's still his glory, but it's his glory coming out of us. And even from the Hebraic perspective, when we talk about the Shekhinah, we're speaking specifically about the glory of his people and the glory of the Lord through his people. Are you following me? And so just by that statement alone, I begin to say, wait, 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 wait. So you're saying the the Shekhinah glory of God is coming through me? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. But doesn't wisdom then speak? When I realize that, 
how I need to take the possession, the position of humility in that, to realize that I am one and in a in a many faceted diamond that that Yahweh is, if you will, to use that as a metaphor, the many faceted diamond of Yahweh. I am one facet, but yet at the same time, I am I am I am shining the light of the Father in everything that He has made me to be. And I've chosen to let my flesh take, I've I've rent the veils of my flesh, put them aside so that his pure light could come. You see, that's where a city that's set up on a hill cannot be hidden. Hidden. Why? Because a city doesn't have one light. A city has multiple lights. Well, or does it? <laughs> or does it? Because isn't that many faceted light still one light? All right. And I'm going to leave you. I, I know that that I hope that brings up some questions. I'm not going to go into what I'd like to go into right there on purpose because I want that to bring up questions of of what that means. Isn't that many faceted light one light? I'll give you a clue. I'll get Holy Spirit said, okay, it's okay to give you a clue. Remember the New Jerusalem, and that in the New Jerusalem, there there is no need for light inside of that because Father Himself is that light. Selah. I'll stop there. All right. Let you make the connection there. Father, I want to thank you. I know we've gone through a lot today, and and I know that there's been so much here. And I'm so thankful that, Father, you brought us to the completion of this first volume in the Mishlei. And we get the opportunity now to move into this second volume, verse chapter 16 through to 31, and and what they represent and how we begin to, to learn even more things uh, from the, the rest of Proverbs. So, Father, I thank you for allowing us the opportunity to take the time to go through each and every one of these verses, to not skip them, to not uh, to not try to, to to talk quickly about something, but to dive into each and every one of of these verses. Because, Father, we thank you that the Proverbs begin to teach us more about who we are. And Lord, you've done just that here in this class. I'm so thankful for the the that that you have portrayed yourself. I've seen many who have, and, and me as well, the, the places where I've learned and where others in here have learned, and we begin to rise above that place of the way that we've seen things before, because we see how we are in you and you are in us, and that we are your emanation of your light here on the earth. So Father, I thank you for that. And so it is from this place that I declare over all those that are here and all of those that are going to be listening on video. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face, his presence, his presence, his countenance towards you and give you peace, blessings, and shalom.